Here's a question. You're going about your day when, all of a sudden, a 350-foot-tall gorilla, a nuclear-powered dinosaur, and an animatronic abomination the size of a skyscraper start battling it out for world domination in front of you. What would you do? Die, probably, but have no fear. We have a breakdown of the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the rise of Mecha Godzilla in Godzilla vs. Kong. It's been five years since Godzilla defeated his greatest enemy, the three-headed dragon from outer space known as King Ghidorah, in a desperate battle that nearly cost him his life. With the natural order restored and the other titans returning to their hibernation, humanity has been monster attack free for a while now, but soon that's all about to change. As the morning sun rises over the jungles of Skull Island, Kong lets out a big yawn and starts going about his daily routine. But something about his kingdom just feels different. His only friend, a young deaf girl from the local Iwi tribe named Jia, tries to cheer him up. But that's when we find out what's wrong. Picking up a tree, Kong chunks it as hard as he can into the sky until it finally collides with a grid of thousands of small screens. Realizing that he's actually being held inside of a giant monarch containment facility, the doctors realize that they can't hold Kong here for much longer, but finding him a new home won't be easy. The island itself has been completely overtaken by the storm that had kept it hidden from the rest of the world, making it uninhabitable. It's it's also the only thing keeping him and Godzilla from tearing each other apart, so they're going to have to figure out another solution. Meanwhile, back in the US, this guy Bernie who works for mega corporation Apex Cybernetics is getting suspicious that they're secretly creating something dangerous. What he doesn't realize is that he's not the only one with his eyes on the facility. While he's secretly downloading some incriminating files, the entire place is suddenly put on high alert as Godzilla himself emerges from the water and starts destroying the plant for seemingly no reason. Instead of evacuating, Bernie here uses the chaos to sneak into a restricted area where he discovers a strange object that looks like a giant glowing eye. By the time that it's all said and done, the entire facility lies in ruins, although the surrounding area is mostly left untouched. Godzilla is back to being seen as a threat to humanity, but they have no idea that they're making a huge mistake. Okay, well, it looks like somebody went and pissed off the big lizard once again. We've got two different titans with two different problems, and we need to figure out what to do with each of them while making sure that they don't end up destroying the entire eastern seaboard before we can get things under control. So where do we start? Let's deal with Kong first. Unfortunately, the king of Skull Island needs a new place to live. And to make things even more difficult, we'll end up with another clash of the titans on our hands. It's not like you can just put this guy up in an apartment downtown either. He needs some space to stretch his legs, but the good news is that we might know just the place. First, let's consider who we're trying to avoid here. Godzilla lives in the open ocean, and as dangerous as he is on land, he's even stronger in the water, so to keep Kong safe, we need to get him as far away from the ocean as humanly possible. Guys, you know how it is. Monarch scientists be like, I know a spot, and then take you to the Eurasian Pole of Inaccessibility. Never heard of it? That's probably because it's the dictionary definition of the middle of absolutely freaking nowhere. Although the exact location can change, slightly depending on where you measure from, the Eurasian Pole of Inaccessibility is located somewhere way out in the Xinjiang region of China, making it the farthest point on the planet from any ocean or coastline, and a great option for hiding Kong from Godzilla. It might not be exactly the kind of climate that Kong is used to, but if they can build a giant biodome here on Skull Island, then I'm sure that the monarch engineers could come up with a way to help him get comfortable out there in the desert and there are also plenty of remote mountain ranges nearby that he might like a little bit better. This place is probably even more remote than Skull Island itself, keeping Kong far away from any major form of major civilization, and most importantly, making him extremely inconvenient for Godzilla to track down. With the time that it would take for the big lizard to get anywhere near him, Monarch would have plenty of time to set up their defenses and work out a backup plan. 
the only problem then becomes how do we actually get Kong over there without Godzilla stopping us first? It definitely won't be easy, but it's possible if we're willing to get creative. Since Skull Island is located somewhere in the South Pacific, the only two ways for Monarch to get Kong that far into Asia are by water or by air. First things first though, if we're going to put Kong in a boat, then we better make sure that it's a banana boat. <laughs> get it? Seriously, if you bring Kong into Godzilla's turf, then it's only a matter of time before the two of them end up in a fight to the death. The key would be to figure out a way to stop Godzilla from finding out what we're up to, which we'll come back to later. Otherwise, they could always try to fly him over so that they could never have to touch the water at all. I mean, it worked that one time back in the 60s, just strap him to some big balloons and send him for a ride. Then Godzilla will never suspect a thing. All right, so we've covered Kong. Now let's turn our attention to Reptar over here. Monarch has already given up on trying to contain him long ago. What they're worried about is how to stop him from destroying cities, and the solution might be easier than they think. This is really elementary school level stuff here, folks. We know by now that Godzilla does not attack unless he's provoked, and he never has at any point since his first appearance back in 2014, when he fought the male Muto in Hawaii. I mean, never, think about it. So can anyone tell me why the military still fired the first shots this time around too? Sure, Godzilla did come in a bit hot, I'll give them that, but there's no better way to escalate any given situation than with a barrage of high explosives. I mean, seriously, did they all drink from the same goblet of stupid juice this morning and forget how this whole thing works? We're supposed to be trying to get along with Godzilla, but any time that he shows up, their first reaction is to shoot him with missiles. And I don't know why I have to be the guy to point this out, but in the last 70 years, that's never worked once. They dropped a hydrogen bomb on him all the way back in 1954, and he literally ate that sh for breakfast. Then it took an oxygen destroyer bomb to even injure him the last time. So what in the absolute f is the point of even trying with these rinky dink little cruise missiles unless your goal is to just get vaporized? That's like finding an angry crocodile in your swimming pool and thinking that you could fend him off with a couple strikes from a wet noodle. You're already cooked. Now, despite this, the news reports say that only eight people were killed in the attack and at least half of them were two fighter pilots and two Apex security guards, which is the first sign that Godzilla wasn't really trying to harm civilians at all. What makes it even more obvious is that only the Apex facility was targeted and the city around it is still mostly in one piece. Let's put our thinking caps on here for a moment. Don't you think that if Godzilla's goal was to cause as much widespread destruction as possible, that he could have done just a little bit better than single digit casualties? Look at this guy. I mean, the truth is that the death toll could easily be in the thousands, and there's nothing that we could have done to stop him. He knows it too, but he still only destroyed the Apex facility and then left peacefully. The evidence is clear that Godzilla wasn't targeting the city. He was targeting the Apex plant. And since we know that he only attacks when he feels threatened, the next steps here should be pretty obvious. The people in charge need to investigate Apex cybernetics and find out what they're really up to. They build advanced technology, including weapons, so it's definitely possible that they were working on something here that Godzilla perceived as a threat, and that's why he chose to attack. If they were, then it's not like they would own up to it after all of the damage that they caused, so the government needs to check it out for themselves. This is important because Apex here is a global company, and if they're doing something at their facilities that causes Godzilla to attack, then there's a significant chance that he could pop up somewhere else and do the same thing. Putting a stop to whatever they're working on is the only way to keep the innocent civilians who live near the other facilities safe. And we can't just let them live at risk because a mega corporation is using their power to cover up their dangerous, Godzilla-provoking activities. If they really want to kill Godzilla, then we've seen that an oxygen destroyer bomb is enough to put him into recovery for at least several years. It's too destructive to use near civilians, but they could either use a device like the Orca to lure Godzilla into a trap somewhere far away from any cities, or use one of the Apex facilities as bait after evacuating the surrounding area. The thing is that we know taking down Godzilla would only create a power vacuum for the other Titans to fill, so it's always better to try to maintain peace with him instead. And if shutting down Apex is the solution, then it's a small price to pay to keep the rest of the world safe.
The following day, Madison, whose father Mark is the director of Monarch, sees the news report of Godzilla's attack and quickly gets the feeling that there's more to this story. She's already had more experience with the Titans than most people and knows that Godzilla doesn't attack unless he's provoked, but the old man refuses to hear her out when she tries to explain. Frustrated, Madison goes home and listens to the latest episode of Bernie's podcast, agreeing with him that Apex must be the ones who really started the problem. Speaking of Apex, the company's founder, Walter Simmons, uses this as an opportunity to announce that they're developing a weapon that will allow humanity to defeat Godzilla for good. Along with Ren Serizawa, the son of Monarch's former head biologist, Simmons tries to recruit Dr. Nathan Lind to lead an expedition into the Hollow Earth in search of an energy source. They have the technology, but what they need is a guide, and Nathan here has just the idea for who to call. According to his research, the Titans should instinctively know the way, and there just so happens to be a giant primate who's looking for a new home. Traveling to Skull Island, Nathan explains his plans to Kong's handler and Gia's adoptive mother, Dr. Eileen Andrews, but she isn't too excited about the idea. Although it takes some convincing, he's finally able to persuade her by arguing that it's their best chance to keep both Kong and humanity safe on Eileen's condition that she and Gia will be joining them to supervise the trip. They don't exactly hook our buddy Kong up with first-class travel arrangements, tranquilizing him and chaining him down to a modified cargo ship that's headed for a hollow earth entrance somewhere in Antarctica. On the first day of their trip, Simmons' daughter Maya shows up to keep an eye on the mission and provides them with their transportation. Three hollow earth aerial vehicles, or AVs for short. For now, everything seems to be going according to plan, but it won't be long before somebody less friendly realizes what they're up to. On dry land, Madison decides that she's going to track down this guy Bernie and find out what he knows, getting help from her friend Josh. They're able to figure out where he lives by asking around at the local grocery stores, but Bernie here doesn't want to talk until he realizes who Madison's parents are. The three of them head to a nearby restaurant, and after earning Bernie's trust, he explains all of the red flags that he's been noticing while working at Apex over the last five years, including the giant eyeball that he saw in the basement. Convinced, Madison and Bernie decide that they need to break into Apex and have a look for themselves, dragging a reluctant Josh along for the ride. The Kong expedition is somewhere off the coast of Australia when, all of a sudden, Gia notices a strange vibration that seems to be coming from the water outside. Terrified, she runs to tell Eileen and the others, but by the time that they find each other, the whole ship is already on red alert. It's Godzilla, and he looks like he's headed straight for Kong. Okay, it looks like we're about to get our first showdown, and right now, the odds don't seem too great for our buddy Kong. Let's see how these two titans stack up and place our bets for who's gonna come out on top. The first thing that anyone would notice about either of these guys is their absolutely colossal size. Kong here is standing at a humongous 337 feet tall and weighing in at more than 150,000 tons. That's taller than the Statue of Liberty and heavier than a fully loaded cruise ship. Now as for Godzilla, he's even taller and surprisingly a bit leaner, coming in at about 390 feet tall and weighing in just under 100,000 tons. All in all, that sounds like a pretty fair matchup on paper, but there's more to consider here. First, let's take the battlefield into account. Being from the jungle, Kong here is more equipped for fighting on land, while Godzilla would naturally have a strong home field advantage here in the open ocean. He's much more agile here than on dry land, and his aquatic nature gives him the ability to breathe underwater, but Kong will drown if he isn't able to surface for air. While they're both skilled fighters, Godzilla has a secret weapon, his atomic breath, which could be absolutely devastating for Kong with just one hit. He also possesses natural regenerative powers that Kong doesn't have, giving him the ability to withstand more damage. I hate to say it, but the hard truth is that Kong doesn't stand much of a chance here. The key would have been to avoid this fight in the first place by doing what we mentioned before and figuring out ways to counter Godzilla's senses. Although there's a lot about the Titan that we still don't understand, we know that Godzilla located 
locates his targets through a combination of sight, smell, hearing, and bioacoustics. Countering his normal senses should have been easy enough for the engineers at Monarch to figure out. As for bioacoustics, Emma Russell already created a device for this a few years back when she finished the Orca, and perhaps they could engineer something similar that, instead of broadcasting a bioacoustic signal, works to camouflage Kongs. The original Orca was destroyed in the fight with Ghidorah, but her husband Mark Russell is the one who helped her create it, so that should at least give the Monarch team a place to start when it comes to making a new one. Monarch is also able to track Godzilla's exact location at any time, which gives them a few options to work with. Knowing the areas where Godzilla likes to go gives you the opportunity to plan a route around his usual territory. It also gives you the chance to throw Godzilla off by creating a distraction. You see, Godzilla isn't just going after Kong for shits and giggles here. He's going after him because he perceives Kong as a threat. Perhaps if he was preoccupied by a more immediate threat somewhere else, then they might have been able to transport Kong without Godzilla noticing. They could have tried using an orca-like device to distract him away to the other side of the planet, or made a coordinated plan to keep him busy with explosives, trying to hassle him with attacks from aircraft and ships somewhere far away while keeping casualties on our side as low as they can. As an added bonus, this might also help to wear Godzilla down a bit, making him weaker if he ever did break away to go after Kong instead. It would have been best to avoid a fight altogether, but now that it's about to go down, they need to do whatever they can to give Kong an advantage. The first thing would be to augment Kong's natural strengths as much as possible. We've seen that Kong can throw trees like spears and use other weapons in the past, so if they could, it would be helpful to hook him up with some kind of improvised weapon to fight with, like the heavy iron chains from the ship. We've already established that this is a fight that Kong probably can't win, so we need to focus on making it so difficult for Godzilla that he chooses to leave on his own. The key to do this is by using any methods available to counter his greatest strengths. They're fairly evenly matched when it comes to throwing hands, but one of Godzilla's biggest advantages is that atomic breath. It seems like he needs to open his mouth to use it, but perhaps his jaws are similar to other reptiles in that they're made for biting down instead of opening up. Maybe Kong could use those chains to hold Godzilla's mouth shut, canceling out his atomic breath, or bait him into firing it off and then just stay out of the way since it's a limited resource that Godzilla needs time to recharge. Another strength in favor of Godzilla here is his aquatic nature, but we've seen in the past that his gills can be damaged. So, knowing this, I'd suggest focusing all of their attacks directly on his gills. It doesn't need to be enough to kill him, just enough to weaken him to the point that he's struggling to fight in the water, which should get Godzilla to call up the assault, at least for now. The same logic applies to Godzilla's endurance in general. He's incredibly strong in short bursts but his massive size means that he tires out relatively quickly. Kong and the humans should continue to pester him with attacks from aircraft and the other boats, allowing them to slowly sap Godzilla's strength over time until he's reduced to a fraction of his true fighting power, which is when they can go in for the final blow. They might even be able to turn the sedatives that they were originally using on Kong against Godzilla instead to accelerate the process. Overall, there are some things that they could do to give Kong a chance, but we're about to see that by the time Godzilla is done with them, they're going to be lucky just to make it off this boat alive. Out on the deck, Kong starts getting more and more aggressive as he realizes that Godzilla is coming. Eileen quickly realizes that they need to release Kong so that he'll at least have a chance to fight back, but the others are still hesitating to cut him loose. Instead, the military tries to handle the situation themselves, launching an all-out assault on Godzilla with everything that they have in their arsenal. But he ends up taking down their fighter jets and battleships without even trying, effortlessly destroying them with his tail as if he hardly even saw them as a threat. In the middle of the battle, an anchor becomes stuck on Godzilla's tail, and he drags the entire front end of the boat underwater as he descends back into the depths. Moments later, it suddenly resurfaces on a direct collision course with Kong, 
only to disappear again as Godzilla dives down before crashing upwards into the ship, flipping the entire vessel upside down while he's still chained to the deck. The inside begins to flood with water while Kong is still struggling against his restraints, but Nathan finally manages to release him just as Godzilla closes in for the kill. As the Titans grapple beneath the waves, Kong stuns Godzilla with a nasty headbutt before swimming back up to the surface, flipping the ship back over as he climbs aboard and beating his chest in a display of dominance. Scanning the area, Kong sees Godzilla circling around for another attack, and that's when he gets an idea. Using the ships like lily pads, he leaps across the water until he lands on the deck of a giant aircraft carrier. With Godzilla closing in, Kong picks up one of the nearby fighter jets and flings it at him like a $60 million dart, striking him directly on his dorsal fins, but Godzilla is not phased. Closing the distance, Godzilla leaps out of the water and climbs onto the deck to face Kong head on. The two of them trade punches until Kong finally knocks him back onto the water, but Godzilla charges up his atomic breath and blasts a hole straight through the ship, with Kong escaping into the ocean just in time. Now the fight is back on Godzilla's turf, and for a moment it looks like Kong here is done for. Just then, the military decides to send in depth charges as a way to disorient the big lizard, and lucky for Kong, it actually works. Exhausted, Kong pulls himself back up onto the boat and immediately collapses, too tired to continue the fight, but Godzilla is still circling back. It's clear that he won't stop until he's convinced that they are not a threat, so thinking quickly, Nathan tells the others to immediately shut down all of their engines and weapons, essentially playing dead. The plan works, and as the boat sits motionless in the water, Godzilla rises up and takes one last look at Kong before returning to the depths. It looks like Godzilla won this round, but it won't be long before these two square off once again. Eileen quickly realizes that they can't start the boat engines again, or else Godzilla will return to finish the job. They need another way to get him to Antarctica, and Nathan decides if they can't travel by water, then they'll have to travel by air instead. Okay, well, that was embarrassing. In the end, the only reason that they managed to survive at all was because Godzilla here decided that they weren't even worth his time anymore. At least he's gone but he did a hell of a lot of damage in the process, and there's something that needs to be said here. Monarch, you f***ed up! Between the pilots looking like they were trying to play the try to avoid Godzilla's tail challenge on level impossible, and the battleships perfectly lining up so that he could take them all out at once, not only are we talking about countless lives lost only one day into this trip, but this whole show would have cost somewhere in the ballpark of $15 billion. Yeah, that's 15 billion with a B, gone in the blink of an eye. That aircraft carrier that they were just fighting on? Yeah, we only have like 10 of those, but now I guess we're down to nine. Here, Monarch, you dropped this, the most expensive fuck up in history award. Not to mention, they brought a 10-year-old child into a Titan fight. And I'm not exactly sure, but I feel like that might be an actual crime. The truth is that this fight would have never happened in the first place if they'd done anything to prevent Kong from attracting Godzilla like we mentioned before. But they pretty much served him up like the goat from Jurassic Park, and I don't think he's going to appreciate that very much at the end of the day. Then, once the fight did start, they went about it all wrong. How many more times do we need to do this before we figure out not to shoot Godzilla with the missiles? It never works and only makes him more angry. If they knew right from the beginning that there was no chance of them winning the fight, then it would have been equally viable to stand down right away in the hopes of convincing him that you're not a threat. I'd hate to leave the path open for Godzilla to just come in and attack, but history shows that he'll respect it even if you don't try to fight him, even when it comes to other Titans. It might be hard to convince Kong about this, but he and the little girl Ja seem to have a special bond. And since she can communicate with him, I think that he would have understood if they were able to get across that it would ultimately keep the girls safer if they tried to avoid a fight. They knew the threats, but still they walked right into Godzilla's territory without doing anything to get prepared and almost ended up paying the price. So congratulations, Monarch, you up. Now, at least they can get to Antarctica without another fight to the death. But if Godzilla thinks that Kong is out of the picture, then the only thing that he might go after next is another Apex facility. 
and the authorities need to get prepared in case that happens. Like, they should start by getting any civilians out of the areas near the Apex plants, or at least have an evacuation plan ready to go at a moment's notice. This will allow the military to intervene, if necessary, without worrying them about casualties, and let them break out the heavy artillery right away. Or, alternatively, give them the option to just let Godzilla destroy whatever he came for and hope that he leaves peacefully once he's done. Using a giant net supported by several Ospreys and heavy lift choppers, the Monarch team are finally able to get Kong to Antarctica and follow him into the tunnel that leads to the Hollow Earth. It isn't long before they hit the point of no return, as suddenly both Kong and the Monarch researchers are sucked straight into a gravitational inversion that catapults them through space-time itself before dumping them out into an enormous subterranean continent. They've finally made it to Hollow Earth, the true home of the Titans. Kong and the scientists eventually arrive at the place that Kong's ancestors once called home. Looking around, Kong finds a massive battle axe before claiming his seat on the throne as the Monarch team lands to search for the source of the Titan's power. Meanwhile, Madison and her friends make their way into the destroyed Apex facility, but the device is nowhere in sight. Just then, they discover a strange purple elevator that's still operational, and the three of them decide to see where it goes. When the doors open, they realize that they're in the middle of a massive storage facility, but end up getting trapped inside one of the shipping containers. With no way out, all that they can do is hold on as they're suddenly launched straight through the center of the Earth. Next stop, Apex's headquarters in Hong Kong. When the container finally comes to a stop, the only path forward leads them into a massive pitch-dark chamber. Suddenly, an alarm sounds as Apex's newest creation emerges from a platform on the floor, the giant robotic titan Mecha Godzilla. Unaware of Madison and the others, Simmons opens up one of the containment pods, releasing the largest skull crawler ever seen into the chamber as well. The beast immediately lunges towards them, but just as it's about to strike, the Mecha obliterates it with one hit of its energy beam, ending the fight before it even started. The craziest part is that the mecha here is only operating at 40% power, but once they're able to find the energy source in the Hollow Earth, their creation will have the strength to rival even Godzilla himself. Lucky to be alive, Madison and the others sneak out of the test chamber and begin exploring the facility until they discover one of the skulls of King Ghidorah that was lost during his battle with Godzilla five years earlier. Simmons purchased the skull and used it to create a sonic uplink, allowing a pilot to telepathically control Mechagodzilla through the same method that Ghidorah's three heads used to communicate with one another. Outside, the peaceful night is suddenly thrown into chaos as Godzilla emerges from the water heading straight for the Apex facility. And this time, he's not playing around. With his dorsal fins already glowing with atomic energy, he crashes into the city with absolutely no regard for human life, destroying anything that stands in his way. The Monarch team scrambles to take control of the situation, evacuating as many civilians as they can and leading the rest down into the Titan attack shelters. But the damage is already catastrophic, and it's not going to stop until Godzilla either finds his opponent or levels the entire city in the process. Okay, this situation looks bad, but if they think quickly, then there's actually a way that Madison and her friends might be able to help. The plan is simple, kick Sarazawa off of the mecha and take over the controls. This would allow them to take out parts of the Apex lab and then get the mecha out of the city to a place where Godzilla can destroy it safely. Bernie should know something about how their computers work, and Josh here looks like he just might know his way around a VR headset. So if they're willing to risk blowing their cover, then they just might be able to save the day before things get any worse. That might be the shortest beat in how to beat history. Holy f Back down in the temple, Maya is starting to get annoyed that she hasn't been able to locate the power source, but just then, Kong's axe begins to glow radioactive blue. Rising from his seat, he crosses the chamber and places the axe down into a matching depression in the cave floor, where it seems to fill with radiation from the core, boosting its power. Sensing this urge of energy, Godzilla suddenly unleashes a blast of his atomic breath straight into the ground boring a new hole down from the streets of Hong Kong into the Hollow Earth. 
The scientists quickly activate a small crab-like drone to extract a sample of the energy source and send a scan of its composition back to Simmons. Despite Eileen's warning that they're once again meddling with powers beyond their abilities to understand or control, the argument escalates until Maya orders her guards to take control of the situation. But Kong lets out a powerful roar when he sees them turning their weapons on his friends, causing the entire chamber to shake and awakening a swarm of terrifying man-eating eating chicken creatures known as Hellhawks. In the confusion, Maya and her team make a break for their vehicle, leaving the others to fend for themselves. With the upload complete, Simmons tells Sarazawa to power up the mecha. His pilot isn't so sure, pointing out that Godzilla will attack the moment that he realizes what they're up to. But Simmons makes it clear that this is not a request, it's an order. Maya makes it to the AV, just as the stragglers from her team are being picked off one at a time. Nathan, Eileen, and Gia make a run for their own vehicle but before they can get to it, they're cut off by two of the Hellhawks, leaving them with nowhere to run. As one of the creatures turns its attention towards Eileen and Gia, Nathan hits it with a stone, getting it to focus on him instead, when suddenly Godzilla's atomic breath finally pierces through the floor of the chamber, opening up a new path straight to Hong Kong. Seeing this as her chance to escape, Maya tells her pilot to go for the hole, ordering them to fire on Kong to get him out of their way. But that was their biggest mistake. The attack does nothing but make him even more angry, and after taking a peek inside to make sure that none of his friends are on board, Kong effortlessly crushes the vehicle like a soda can. As the chamber begins to collapse, Kong grabs his axe and leaps forward into the hole, followed by Nathan and the other survivors. Okay, it looks like it's time for round two, but this time it's going to be on different turf, and Kong here might not be in as bad of a spot as he was out in the open water. We still have the same two contenders that we all know and love, but now Godzilla is going to be in a weakened state after literally boring a hole straight down into the center of the earth while Kong just found an ancient battle axe from the days of his ancestors. As a matter of fact, let's take a closer look at that bad boy for a minute. Kong's new weapon is over 200 feet long, featuring a sturdy bone handle and a razor sharp blade made out of a dorsal plate from one of Godzilla's fallen comrades. Besides giving him the power to deal even more devastating damage, it can also be used to block attacks, even absorbing a direct strike from Godzilla's atomic breath. Now we're talking. Since we're officially back on dry land, the environment also works more in Kong's favor here than Godzilla's this time around. We all know that Kong loves a good skyscraper, and here in Hong Kong, he can use the buildings to maneuver around and take advantage of his superior agility to avoid Godzilla's attacks, while also positioning himself so that he can get in some effective hits from the flank. Being in a city, he can throw entire pieces of buildings at Godzilla, giving him a ranged attack. It's still not quite as powerful as Godzilla's atomic breath, but at least Kong has more options to work with here. To win this fight, Kong Kong is going to want to take advantage of all these new factors to gradually wear Godzilla down, especially now that he's already significantly weakened from that burst of atomic breath. The key is to let Godzilla get tired and then go for the knockout. This time it looks like Kong has a much better chance of holding his own, but once Simmons gets that mecha fired up, everything is going to change. Moments later, Kong emerges back out on the surface, where he immediately comes face to face with Godzilla. It looks like it's time for a rematch, and he's ready to bring the pain with his new weapon. Charging into battle, Kong leaps towards Godzilla with an earth-shattering overhead strike, but overshoots his target and ends up losing the axe when it gets stuck in the side of a building. Still, he's able to control the fight by aggressively keeping the pressure and redirecting Godzilla's atomic breath every time before he has a chance to fire. Finally, Godzilla gets off an accurate shot, but Kong manages to grab the axe just in time, using it to block the onslaught as he leaps through the air and brings the supercharged weapon down onto Godzilla's head. The blast is so powerful that it sends them both crashing to the ground, but it looks like Godzilla took the brunt of the impact, and this time it's Kong who comes out on top. Shaking it off, Godzilla gets back to his feet and begins searching the city for Kong, who ambushes him with a sneak attack from the top of a nearby skyscraper. Furious, he body slams Kong down to the streets and begins relentlessly tearing into his chest with his razor-sharp claws, overpowering him with sheer aggression. 
pinning Kong to the ground. Godzilla roars directly into his face, and Kong responds with a roar of his own, but Godzilla can sense that his enemy is defeated, leaving Kong in a heap while he turns his attention back to the Apex facility. At the Apex lab, Madison and her friends are quickly apprehended while trying to investigate the Ghidorah skull, and brought before the head honcho Simmons himself. Furious, Madison shouts at him that none of this would have happened if they hadn't provoked Godzilla in the first place. But Simmons only laughs it off, saying that it's time for humanity, and by extension himself, to be back at the top of the food chain. With that, he orders Sarazawa to fire up the mecha, but something's wrong. The mecha is no longer responding to the pilot's controls, forcefully disconnecting him and beginning to move under its own free will. Before Simmons can even realize what's going on, the mecha raises its claw and brings it crashing down into the observation room, taking him down and electrocuting the pilot. Now that it's free from Apex's control, the mecha blasts its way out of the mountainside and begins laying waste to the city with its energy beams, before turning to face off against the real Godzilla himself. Although he's able to hold his own for now, the King of the Monsters seems to have finally met his match, and it looks like he's going to need some help. Okay, well folks, I guess this is what happens when you let a combination of an extraterrestrial demon and ChatGPT take control of the most dangerous weapon ever created. Is anyone actually surprised that this thing immediately went full Terminator mode and decided to vaporize all life on Earth as soon as it got the extra juice? Because I, for one, am not, but maybe that's just me. Let's take a quick look at this giant Freddy Fazbear and see what we're up against. Somehow, Mecha Godzilla here makes Kong, and even Godzilla himself, almost look small by comparison. Standing at 400 feet tall and weighing more than 600,000 tons. Now that he's at full power, the Mecha was able to break out of Apex's control, taking an already bad situation and making it worse than we ever could have imagined. Like we mentioned before, he's now controlled by a combination of Ghidorah's consciousness and the AI developed by Apex that makes for one terrifying Terminator lizard. It also immediately explains why he turned hostile towards the civilians and seemed to actually enjoy doing it. In terms of armaments, the mecha here features a red energy beam called the A74 Proton Scream Cannon and it's strong enough to seriously damage Godzilla if he lands a direct hit. He's also equipped with a fearsome variety of secondary weapons, including buzzsaw claws and jaws that can cut through titan skin, punches and kicks that are boosted with hollow earth energy, shoulder-mounted missile launchers, and even a razor-sharp drill on the end of his tail. He's also made up of extremely durable metals, allowing him to take a lot of damage without going down and high-powered thrusters for quick movement around the battlefield. One of his only weaknesses would have been to take out the pilot and controls, but that won't work now that he's running the show by himself. With that being said, he still consists of electronic parts, and exploiting that critical weakness might be the key to victory. My first instinct would be to try to use an EMP against the mecha to weaken him. The device could be man-made, or they could call in some help from an unlikely ally, the Queen Mudo and technically has to listen to Godzilla since he established himself as the Alpha Titan. Perhaps they could wake her up from hibernation and use her natural EMP to disrupt the mecha's electrical components, making him easier to take down. Being man-made instead of biological, the mecha won't have the same regenerative abilities that Godzilla and the other titans do, which means that with enough damage, even from conventional human weapons, he should eventually go down. Knowing this, I'd suggest focusing their fire on one of his legs first to reduce his mobility and make him easier to manage, or targeting his eyes so that he can't see what he's fighting because sight is most likely the sense that he relies on most in battle. Clearly, the mecha is more than a match for Godzilla, but if he and Kong team up, then they just might stand a chance. With the two Godzillas battling it out in the distance, the Monarch team goes to check on Kong, and Gia quickly notices that his heartbeat is slowing down. 
Kong is going to die unless they do something, but that's when Nathan decides that he's going to use the HEAV as a makeshift defibrillator to bring Kong back into the fight. Setting the vehicle to self-destruct, he makes it to safety just as the massive burst of electricity restores Kong's strength. He can see that Godzilla is getting worked not too far away, and Jia explains that they need to work together to defeat this new threat. So Kong decides that he's going to help. The mecha tosses Godzilla through the city like a ragdoll, but just when it's about to take him out once and for all, Kong leaps onto its back and redirects its energy beam, giving Godzilla the opportunity to get back on his feet. Now that they're working together, the two titans start fighting like a tag team to defeat the mecha, but it's still packing enough firepower to take them both on single-handedly. Just when it looks like all hope is lost, Josh pours Bernie's flask out onto the mecha's control panel, stunning it for just long enough that Godzilla is able to supercharge Kong's axe with his atomic breath. Using his overcharged weapon, Kong begins hacking the mecha to pieces, dismantling it one limb at a time before finally tearing its head right off of its body. With a triumphant roar, down on the street level, the survivors all regroup, relieved that the battle is finally over. Or at least, that's what they think. Suddenly, they hear Godzilla roaring aggressively as he makes his way towards Kong. The two of them stare each other down, but Kong drops his axe, showing that he doesn't want to fight anymore. And Godzilla returns to the water, forming an uneasy truce with his new ally now that the real threat has been dealt with. In the months that pass, Kong finds a new home in the mountains of the Hollow Earth, but it won't be long before the time comes that humanity needs their Titan protectors once again. Man, that was kind of epic, and I can't wait for more. They seriously need to put more of these movies out, because I'm showing up with tickets in hand and popcorn in the other fist. But let us know down in the comments what you thought should have gone down. Thank you so much for watching. Leave a like and subscribe, and check out that How To Beat playlist for more videos just like this one. I'll see you guys in the next video, and have a damn good day.